Grant Denya now. It's Grant Denya. The gold Logie this year. Oh my God! It's Grant Denya. And our mom, Shazzy Denya. She's really crazy. And George, affectionately known as Large Sarge. It's all true. It's all true. The podcast with Grant and Shazzy Denya. And George. <laughs> Hello and welcome to It's All True. We have such a big episode today. I am so excited. Well, I'm nervous because uh, (laughs) we've got a relationship expert on and I'm the first to admit I ain't uh, ain't guy perfect. You know what I mean? Look, we've been together for a good uh, 13 years now. 14. 14 years now. 14 Uh, (laughs) years married. (laughs) And it's always a work in progress, right? We evolve. We're human beings. We are not perfect. We are flawed and we are works in progress. And that's totally okay. So when it comes to kind of living through our relationship day to day. And and I have to also interrupt there because. Okay. Well, there's, there's the first red flag. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because our guest today, he has so many different titles. But the one thing that I really want to get him on here to talk about today is happiness. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he is also a love coach. Yeah. Well, I think American TV might have kind of pushed him into that direction. But he is, and it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert Mack, um, all the way from Miami. We'll give you a big applause. <laughs> Woo! Uh, uh, correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. You are a happiness expert. And also love and relationship coach to celebrities. Um, that is a big job. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is a big job. I mostly think of myself as a happiness expert, as you said, and I sort of reluctantly uh, became known as a dating and love and relationship coach. Uh, but like Grant said, we're all works in progress, you know. Yeah, yeah. I okay. So. Part of our relationship is that I am, uh, and I don't even know how to um, how to word this. This is this is an issue, okay, that deals with happiness. I love being happy, and I feel like everybody should be really upbeat and happy all the time. Now that annoys the shit out of Grant because <laughs> he is more of a realist, and he always says you can't be happy all the time. Um, well, you can, but you can't expect everyone else to to yes, to, to right. match your your level of happiness. Yeah. So, is that true happiness? Can some people be happy all the time? Is that a thing? Yeah. Is that fake? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it depends. We can answer that at multiple levels. So, if we answer it at a level of let's say psychology, um, psychologists would generally say no, nobody's going to be happy all the time, and it's, in fact, you need the bitter to experience the sweet. You need the unhappiness to really know what happiness is. And so they say, no, it's the contrast of life that makes life so beautiful. And you want to experience the entire spectrum or range of human emotion. So everything from, you know, depression sometimes and sadness all the way up to, you know, scales to happiness and bliss. Now we can go deeper and we can answer that from a deeper, I guess, maybe uh, spiritual perspective. And I would say that we're all not only happy all the time, but we all consist of happiness itself all the time. And the way I would define happiness is it's peaceful aliveness. The life within us is already peacefully alive. And sometimes we're aware of it. That's when we say we're happy. Sometimes we're not aware of it. And that's when we say we're unhappy. But it's kind of like a quality or trait, like kindness or honesty or integrity. It's always there. And it's always something we can access and tap into. Some moments we do a better job of that than others. Wow. Well, the first part of what you just said, I thought, Crap, Grant's right. Because you always say that everybody needs to experience. Thank you, all, Robert. All You're of- welcome to come back anytime you like. It's a rare win, but I'll take it. But the I second you, part, of, the second part of what you're saying makes me feel like maybe, maybe I am kind of correct. Maybe I'm just much better at being more connected to my inner happiness. Yeah, I don't know what it is about you. And you've always been this since the start. And I thought perhaps it was a fake form of happiness that you were trying to externally portray to everyone. Like, you know, everything's fine and I'm great and I'm evolved and I'm happy and nothing gets me down. But the more I've got I've got to know you, you you very rarely will ever dip low. But I kind of I'm kind of with Robert. It's the lows that make the highs feel high, mm. right? You need that range. You know, the, the sweet doesn't taste sweet without the sour. So mm. you, 
it's yeah, it's one of those things where I know I know you look at me and sometimes, you know, if if I'm not operating at 10 and I can't operate at 10 out of 10 all the time, that's just not physically possible for me. And I know that it worries you that if I'm starting to dip below a five, but for me, that's okay because I know I can come out of it. But it it does set off alarm bells in you and it, mm. and, it, and, it, and it worries you, but it doesn't worry me. Mm, it's obviously it, something. You know, you're, you're highlighting something else, something else really profound and important to, you know, underscore here, which is that, you know, positive psychologists and positive psychologists is a study in science of happiness. So it's like 20 years old and it's really, you know, this Ivy League research in science around what makes for happy life and what doesn't. And one of the things they say is that happiness doesn't equate to positive emotion only. It's more than that. It's meaning and it's purpose and all these other things. And so happiness, I would say, at the deepest level is formless, but it can show up in different forms. So some people will call themselves happy, but they don't have a huge smile on their face all the time. That's for sure. And other people will say, you know, um, they're unhappy, but they might always be smiling. And so it's sometimes difficult to know if someone's truly, genuinely happy just by the way they look or the way they sound, the way they talk. And that can sometimes also make us second guess whether somebody who seems so happy is actually so happy. Uh, mm-hmm. I know I struggled with that for a long time. I mean, the reason I do the work I do now is because I was so deeply depressed and even suicidal for a while. So I always distrusted people who seemed very upbeat and happy. I just didn't think they were telling the truth. But yeah, I like Grant. Yeah, I, 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 I <laughs> was like that. Absolutely <laughs> here because you know we are. We are a spectrum and we are, we are a range of emotions and it's, mm. it's okay to experience and live and feel all of those emotions at, at certain points. And sometimes I feel like, you know, when, when you're around a very positive person like, like, like Shezzy and you might be enduring a little bit of toughness, whether it, be my, it might be your work environment, perhaps, you know, things aren't quite where you wished they or hoped they were at this stage of your life. And, and it would always frustrate me when someone would try and artificially lift you up because you, you were like, you are, you're discounting my experience here and you're mm-hmm. undermining my emotions. And, and, and for you to say to me, hey, you got nothing to be sad about does not make me feel less sad. And all mm-hmm. it does, it just makes me question my own sanity. And, and, and I found that very I found that quite problematic and I felt it quite confrontational. I could see where she was coming from, but I felt like what I was experiencing was, was, being diminished. was not real and it was being diminished. And then I was starting to call into question, you know, yeah, my, my, yeah, my own sanity. It's, it's tricky trying to help someone out, right? Oh my gosh, you nailed it. Look, when I started this positive psychology practice of mine, it's private practice, like 20 years ago, I thought I would mostly, mostly be spending my time encouraging people, uplifting people, inspiring people, educating people. And I realized that's not it. Most people come into session and they mostly just want to be heard and listened to and they want to be validated and normalized. They want someone to empathize with them. And that was tough for me because I am an encourager and I want to get people feeling better right away. But I discovered if I did that too soon or too quickly or too assertively, there'd be like this knee jerk reaction and they didn't like it. You know, it made them feel even worse. Like you didn't, you don't really understand what I'm growing through and you're discounting it and you don't understand how frustrated and disempowered or anxious I really am. And so they would feel more of all that. So you nailed, nailed something really big there, Grant, you know, when we're wanting to connect with people, you know, we don't want to hide our light under a bushel. You know, if you're happy, please remain happy. We need more happy people in the world. That's for sure. And we can also at the same time, meet people where they are with our words in a way that makes them feel seen and heard and understood. That is very important, and uh, and we did speak about that a lot. We went through, we looked at, um, was it toxic positivity? positivity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I yeah. first heard that term and then saw the list, I was like, that's that's what makes me the angriest in, yeah. in terms of all your beautiful traits that you've got going on. That one best described what was happening to my experience when mm. you were trying to influence my sphere of, you know, for where I was at. And mm. it was just like, you're right. Yeah. It, yeah. When that, when that term was dropped, it was, it was a, it was a bombshell for me, but then I could, I could name it, I could place it. And then, and then I realized there was no malice in her intent. But, and, and yeah. also, sorry. And I also, point, no, yeah, please. sometimes I think that uh, in, in our scenario, when you're looking at a partner who is going through, you know, a bit of depression and you, you want to lift them up, 
it's very difficult to do that. And when you can see that they look for external things to make them feel happy, um, whereas you you know that their internal mechanisms are enough to be happy, that's a really tricky scenario. So, oh, you nailed it. I mean, that that's one of the challenges that I have um, myself. You know, it's I'm I'm the least likely person I think in the world to be a happiness coach because I was always so miserable, you know? And so it's always <laughs> ironic to me when I have conversations like this, because there's a part of me that's like, no, 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 Rob, you know, this is not who you are now, but, it, but, but I am. And to your point, it is very difficult to sort of uplift and inspire people, you know, especially and often when you know them so well. Sometimes when you know someone so well, that can actually get in the way of them feeling more uplifted and inspired, uh, surprisingly or strangely enough. But at the end of the day, you're both right. I mean, emotion is very contagious. And so if you can just continue to be happy, that in of itself often is much more influential and even convincing or persuasive in terms of getting the other person to come around and feel uplifted and feel inspired and feel happier. And sometimes we can show people better than we can tell them, right? So you can show him and I can show people, I try to show people through our living shining example more than we can tell them with our words. Sometimes it's the words that drive people the craziest because they feel like they're not being heard. Um, and so the toxic positivity thing is, is interesting too because the tox- you know, I don't think we can ever be too positive, but we can be too fake in our positivity, right? So we can sometimes try to paste smiley stickers on empty gas tanks and we still want to address challenges and problems in the world. And we still want people to know that we care about the you know, issues they're facing and the adversity that they're going through. But at the same time, we want to help and encourage people to think about it in more um, optimistic or encouraging or supportive or constructive ways. And so there's an art and science to that, you know, doing that well so that people don't feel, mm, I don't know, disenfranchised or maybe not listened to. Yeah. Mm. Sometimes when we see someone like you, and I've seen you on lots of clips on American television, and you're glamorous and you're good looking, and you've got a great rig and a beautiful jaw, and you're um, articulate, model. And, and you're oh. more, yeah, like actor. Yeah. <laughs> like, like you've got it all going yeah. on, right? But when you take when Venmo, we... PayPal, Cash App, what do you take, Grant? I'm going to send you some money <laughs> to compliment my friend. I'm going to hire you full time. I'm going to things, but I'll still try. And like you, you said, you, you often look at yourself and go, you know, a happiness coach. That's, that's not who I am. That's not where I've come from. It, it, explain to us and share with us if you feel comfortable, you know, your journey of where you've come from. If that wasn't you, it, it can sometimes inspire us because we see you as a picture of perfection, a, a guy who's got it all together. But was that not necessarily the case? Oh, my goodness. No, absolutely not. I mean, just the opposite was the case from my uh, perception and perspective as a kid. I mean, my first memories in life were ones of being depressed and deeply suicidal. I mean, I hated myself, genuinely hated everything about myself, the way I looked, the way I talked, the way I walked, the way I did everything. And I always thought I would grow out of it. I thought, well, you know, maybe one day I'll do well in school and I'll hopefully do well in sports. I want to be a professional basketball player. And I thought, man, I, if I could become a professional basketball player, that'll save me from all this misery. I'll make lots of money. I'll be famous and popular. I'll have a girlfriend finally. And my life will be perfect and better. And, of course, that didn't happen. And despite my life getting better in all ways, really, I mean, I eventually got a good job. I did have a wonderful girlfriend. I did well in school. Um, made good money. I just became more and more depressed. And I became so depressed that I started researching ways to kill myself. And so... I eventually decided I was going to slash my wrist. So I remember going to the kitchen, got a kitchen knife, like a steak knife, and I dug it into my wrist. still have the suicide test mark in my wrist to this day. I always can't see them on the screen. But something very unpredictable happened when I dug this knife into my wrist. And that is, like, without anything changing. Like, again, I had a pretty good life. And actually, I felt guilty because my life was so good, but I didn't feel happy for it. I didn't feel grateful for it, no matter how hard I tried. So despite nothing changing my external circumstances, when I dug that knife in, I felt this ineffable peace and joy and love, the likes of which I had never experienced before. It was mind blowing. I was like, what's going on here? How could I feel so good at what I would consider the worst moment of my life? You know, the moment I was going to take my life. And so at that moment, I decided to postpone the suicide for like, honestly, it was like 10 minutes. I mean, I don't even know if it was a full 10 minutes. I was just like, I'm going to put it off for a little while, do a little research and see if I discover anything here that would be worth 
applying or remembering. And, you know, that was several a couple decades ago. And ever since then, things just got better and better. Wow. What do you, what do you put that, that intervention down to that, 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 that flood of love, some sort of cosmic intervention, some sort of religious experience, some sort of, what, what is it? Awakening. Yeah, I, I would call it definitely an awakening. It's all those things. And what it mostly is in the simplest language is that for once in my life, I stopped overthinking. And when I stopped overthinking, really stopped thinking altogether, what I call the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, so the eternal sunshine, the eternal happiness of the quiet mind, finally just came to the surface. I felt it in a palpable way, it sort of penetrated the rest of me. And it was just a small glimpse, but it was enough of a glimpse to say, oh, wow, I don't need to change any of my external circumstances to Chesney's point. I can actually feel happier here and now if I just knew the secret, if I just knew a master key, if I just had a cheat code to doing it right. So yeah, it was just that my over-analytical, over-thinking, over-anxious mind finally got out of the way for a little while. And I returned to this like childlike innocence that was full of awe and wonder. And even that is saying too much because it wasn't, there were no thoughts there. <laughs> it's just a feeling of like, all is well. All is well. Wow. wow. That's so cool. That's so cool. And, and in today's age, we all, I think, look for, you know, external things. So, you know, I, I can be happy when I lose weight. I can be happy when I can afford, you know, a nice car. I'll be happy when it's just kind of ingrained in us, isn't it? From, uh, yeah. Yes, it is. We've got this destination addiction, you know, destination addiction. I think of like Alice in Wonderland. There's so many great quotes in Alice in Wonderland. And one of the quotes is, um, here, you have to run as fast as possible just to stay in place. And if you want to get ahead, you have to run faster than possible, <laughs> which is obviously impossible. But that's the idea. Yeah. We're all running as fast as possible to some destination that we're not all that clear about. And the evidence is out. It doesn't matter what you accomplish, achieve, or acquire. For the most part, it's not going to make you lastingly, meaningfully, and abidingly happier. You know, you might get a little bit of pleasure and you might feel a little better for a while, but it quickly fades. You know, human beings are like cockroaches. We adjust to everything, the best and the worst. And so you're absolutely right. Um, scientists didn't come up with a happiness formula. And they say that if you can imagine your perfect life, so imagine as much money as you want, as many or as few kids as you want, as many houses on the beach as you want, all of that together at best only accounts for about 10% of how happy or unhappy you are. So if you had your perfect life, at best, you'd only be a couple percentage points happier than you are now. And to a large extent, it wouldn't last in the way that you think it would last. Wow. Mm. Yeah. It's, so, it's, it's so profound. How, like, how do, we, how do we get to that point where you were, where you just don't overthink, you're not looking for that destination happiness? Like, how do we bolster what's in here and, and, and be happy? Yeah. Um, practice is the short answer. Practice. You know, we don't practice happiness. Somebody tells us to practice being happy. And in fact, we're encouraged to do just the opposite. Be miserable so you can buy my stuff or you can tune into my, you know, whatever it is out there in the world. And so the challenge and opportunity is just to practice happiness. And you can just do it moment to moment. Um, the way I say it is think less, enjoy more. Think less, feel more. And one of the simplest techniques I've ever discovered is what I call micro meditation. You just remind yourself that, listen, hopefully you have 100 years left in these beautiful human flesh costumes, but maybe you also only have a day left or an hour, God forbid. But the truth is we only have this moment. And so the idea is that you forget the future for a moment, you forget the past for a moment, and you just try to enjoy this single breath, this single moment as deeply as you can by letting all your thoughts go. So you breathe in through the nose, out through the stomach, or out, out of the mouth, and you let your stomach expand and contract. And you let your thoughts go. And the only goal is to try to enjoy or juice or milk this one moment and this one breath for as much joy as you can get out of it. If you practice that throughout the day, every day, in about 22 to 66 days, you'd rewire your brain to do it automatically. Wow. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. It, it's not something that I could do very easily, but it's something that I can do occasionally if I find I'm really stuck in my head. 
and I'm, I'm really on a loop that's not serving me any great purpose and I need to sort of snap out of that. Sometimes I just stop and go, look around and just see what you see. Say what you see. And then I go, there's a bird over there sitting on a branch. Oh, it's calling out to another bird. And I go, look up. Oh, look at that cloud. That cloud is the shape of a puppy dog. Or oh, I can hear a kid riding a bike. And just using those couple of senses, my eyesight and my ears, I can snap out of the, the mental fog that I'm currently stuck in. And it just shakes me out of that zone. And, and it really just me, I'll just say, I'll just say five things. Just find five things with your eyes and your ears. And then bang, I've, I've kind of, I've broken the shackles of that moment. Well, Grant, if you steal my client, <laughs> it's so upset because that was such a great, great tip and trick right there. And that's precisely what I encourage my clients to do is, you know, be more present and get more into your five physical senses. Okay. So get out of your head and get into your body. And the more you're in your body, the less you'll be in your head and you'll find that problem, I promise you, whatever it is that you're worried about, it'll still be there when you come back to it in five minutes or five hours or five seconds. It'll still be there. But when you return after resting your mind for a little while and distracting yourself for a little while or breathing for a little while, your creative abilities and insights is so much better. You're a much better problem solver. You know, the brain, the mind is a fantastic problem solver, especially when it gets rest. But when it doesn't, when it's working all day, every day and thinking all day, every day and worrying all day, every day, it's just as much a troublemaker as it is a problem solver. And so we want to tap into the problem solving ability and not so much the troublemaking. Mm. Yeah, I why is it? Why is it that, um, and the, uh, this could be totally wrong, but oh, no, I'm mm. speculating here. Why is it that really high performing people um, seem to be the unhappiest I was just thinking a similar thing to you. So oh, I'll, yeah? I've got a point after that, but yeah. like, like to hear your answer, Robert. Yeah, a number of reasons. Um, so one, we know that um, happiness and success is sort of a bell curve, right? So the happier you get, the more successful you become for a long, for a long time, right? But then at some point, you hit a place where um, in order to be more successful, it helps to be very miserable. <laughs> it helps to be very miserable because then you're operating from this place of fear and anxiety and insecurity all the time. And you always think you need more and to accomplish more. And so it continues to drive you beyond what anybody else would be driven to do. Now, all successful people, all extraordinarily successful people aren't unhappy. We know that. We know that lots of people, in fact, most people are pretty happy who are successful, but they're not happy because they're successful. They're successful because they're happy, right? So when you see these little outliers, you know, the celebrity who has everything but is suicidal or the pop singer who's so you know fantastic performer, but they just seems always so depressed. Those folks are outliers. And a lot of times what drove their success was a dirty energy. It was the unhappiness itself, the misery itself, the insecurity itself. They were slighted at some young age and they still remember it and they're trying to prove everybody wrong or they're trying to prove themselves worthy. And so those people sometimes are driven in ways that other people might not be. Um, now, there's that. There's an expression that sort of captures all that, which is, you can never get enough of something you really don't need, right? And the problem with sort of very successful people is sometimes they think they just need more success or more money or more material possessions in order to solve for the happiness. So they never turn around and look inside to identify and pull out the root or cause of the problem, which is an unconstructive, unsupportive way of thinking and being in the world, mm. right? So that's, that's often what happens with um, very successful people that are unhappy. But surprisingly enough, happiness leads to success for most people improves your chances of success. So in other words, happy people live longer lives, 67 years longer. They make about 600 to 700,000 uh, US dollars more on average um, yes. than, yes, than their unhappy counterparts over the course of their lifetime. They get married earlier, stay married longer, are happy in all the relationships whether they're married or not. They're rated as more attractive than their unhappy peers. Uh, you know, they're healthier than their unhappy peers. So to a large extent, in fact, in almost all ways, Happiness improves your life conditions and circumstances. It actually improves your likelihood of success. But there are outliers. There are some folks that are extraordinarily successful but are miserable. Yeah, there's the, of course there. Yeah, the, 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 the tortured artist uh, is, mm. is a classic example of that. But I, I must admit, you know, I've been very fortunate, Robert, to have a great television career here in Australia, you know, hosting some, some big name, you know, brand shows, some global brands. And, and I think a lot of that success for me um, came from a place of unhappiness. 
I think it came from, you know, my mom and dad separated when I was very young. So, you know, I, I, I think I was very keen to impress, you know, I, I was I was in very very much need of needing that fatherly love. My father lived quite quite a fair way away from us, so you know I wasn't able to see him all the time. So, you know, wanting to prove something to him, feeling I was not worthy, feeling I'm unlovable, feeling you know I'm a, I'm a smaller guy as well. So like in a in a big school environment, I was very intimidated. You know, I I felt scared. I felt like I I didn't cut through. I I didn't you know I was. I was sort of lost in 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 the noise and the hustle and bustle, and I was just I wasn't also I I wasn't also also a a very academic kid, so I didn't feel like I was very smart. So I was like, I'm going to have to really pull a rabbit out of a hat here if I'm going to try and make something happen. And it was from all those what you sort of called a, a, a dirty energy was also the nucleus for all those big drivers for me that made me go, no, I'm going to. I'm I'm going to go hard. If I'm going to make something happen, it's up to me, you know, because there's no one else is going to jump in and save me and make this happen for me. So from that, from those, from those fears, I, I was able to build a career. And like you said, go, go harder than the person next to me, you know, work longer, say yes to more, uh, be the employee that everyone wants to have around um, shoot for the stars really. Cause I felt like I had no other option. So, but you, you finding the point at which, to go, okay, I am enough was, was very hard. You know, I have enough. I am enough. I, I that getting to that point and then making that switch was very difficult because turning off all those drivers that had made me a success would now I was, I was, I was clinging to them because they had made me a success. And I, and I, re, and I found it very hard to cut the cord. You know, um, first of all, gosh, man, I love that so much, brother. What you just shared and the way you shared it is so inspiring. It gave me shivers just to feel and experience someone so confidently vulnerable, someone as, success, as successful as you, you know, we all need to hear that, you know, because lots of us, I was driven in that precise and exact way for so long. And that's why I was so miserable. And you're a testament, um, you know, to the life that can be lived when you're transparent, when you're confident and vulnerable in that beautiful way. So first of all, I want to thank you for that, man. That's huge. Like that inspires me. Um, and you're also right. Like the second piece of that, your self-awareness around it and your ability to sort of pivot from there is huge because you're right. You got to a place where you finally, hopefully for most people, you acquire enough, achieve enough, accomplish enough. And you say, man, well, if I am not happy with this level of success, obviously success isn't the answer. You know, it's like Rick, uh, Jim Carrey said so beautifully, he said, I want everyone to accomplish their desires and dreams and become rich and successful. So they can finally realize it's not the answer. It's not the answer to your unhappiness. Mm. so true yeah it's so true that's because yeah. uh, uh, that's what we're taught the goal is because we are we are in a consuming world we are taught yeah. to be very good very very mm. good consumers right it's a material world and that's what is pushed on us because you know all of our marketing all of our advertising all of our media is all about training us to be good purchasers of goods mm. right and then if i buy that good i will look like that person i'll have that kind of success and then realizing it's it's similar as uh, similar as fame. You 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 come to the point of realizing that the fame doesn't give you the happiness, and you'll come to a point that buying that car does not give you the happiness. It's the same kind of lesson, but it can take a long time, if at all, to ever learn it. And sometimes it takes a collapse of all of that to be able to sift through what's important. But you hope yeah. you get the answer before the collapse. Well, you nailed it. I mean, you know, it's funny when I started um, my psychology practice, I often thought, you know, and felt. Like the people that didn't, they weren't very successful would be the status cases. You know, folks that were unhappy and also didn't have um, a whole lot of success and uh, money or material possessions. But in some ways, I feel I'm sad for the folks that are extraordinarily successful and have lots of money and are still really miserable and don't, can't fully accept or embrace or understand what I, what I mean when I say, hey, <laughs> this happiness thing is an inside job. It comes from the inside out. They, they have a heart. It's like, man, and the challenge there is they can't really appreciate or enjoy anything at all you know and so anyway it's a, a, a tough lesson that we're all taught you know life is the best teacher of all but her prices are exorbitant and ideally we want to learn not through suffering we want to learn through intelligence or through other people's suffering you know rather than our own uh, but we all tend to be a little hard-headed i know i've been very hard-headed so i sometimes have to learn the hard way but that being said there are really brilliant books out there there are brilliant teachers out there 
that can show you and teach you the shortcut or the lazy intelligent way to be happy here and now without anything needing to change or anybody needing to change your life. And what's fascinating and fantastic about it is that not only then are you happy, which is the point of the success anyway, but that happiness drives your success and leads to success, the kind of success that you want in a much less effortful, much more enjoyable fashion. That's the beautiful thing about it. So I love talking about happiness so much because you can have it all. You can have both. You can be happy and successful too. You just don't want the success to drive you. You want the happiness to be driving the success. Mm. How Does ego get in the way, do you think, of happiness sometimes? The only thing that gets in the way. And the way I would describe ego is believing that you need something else, different, better, or more to be happy or at peace or to feel self-love, right? Mm. So ego is just a belief in not enoughness. The thought and belief that shows up as a feeling as not enoughness. That's the only thing that gets in the way of, 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 uh, of happiness. Uh, it can even gets in the way. It just sort of clouds that eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. It's always there inside you. But yes, um, and ego is nothing more than a thought, and the thought can be dropped. And what about gratitude? How important is the, the practice of gratitude? I'm a huge believer in gratitude. You know, I want to feel grateful about as many things as humanly possible because I like feeling good. I'm selfish that way. I'm a hedonist that way. So um, also, I like when other people feel good because then they're nicer. <laughs> they're easier to get along with. They cause fewer problems. Uh, gratitude is everything. In some ways, we might even say that gratitude is a synonym for love or a synonym for happiness. I mean, I think happiness, love, peace, gratitude, these are just different ways of seeing the same energy, uh, but they're just really synonyms for the same ultimate experience that we're after. Are you a manifester? I, I am. I believe that we're all manifestors, and I think we're manifesting all the time, whether we know it or not. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I must admit, like when I think about the career I have today, I go, wow, despite all the odds, I got there. And then, and then I think back when I planted that little nucleus, that little seed, and I remember going to bed as a kid. I might have been 13, 14, maybe 15 at nighttime going, okay, what I see around me, I, I don't see a life that people are living that I want. So this is what I want. And then I would, at each time at night, I would visualize what that might look like. And, and, and I would go, that, that's, that's the goal. And it was just an idea. It was just, it might've been a, a slight vision. I'd give it a visual picture. I'd give it a name. You know, it might have been a simple, you know, I would like to be well-known and successful. And, and, and that was from my, my naive child, teenage brain, right? But I think, I think that's where it started. And I think the, and I know this sounds a bit woo-woo, and, and, and particularly if you're doing it tough, you know, it's very hard when someone goes, oh, you know what, just manifest it and it'll happen. <laughs> and I get how ludicrous that can sometimes sound when, when you're up against it and, and, and you're having issues in your life. But I think somewhere that energy that you put into that thought, little doors, little opportunities, just step, little micro steps just come your way and things that otherwise wouldn't have happened start to appear in your field of view. And, and I, I, I firmly believe that and I'm trying to tell my girls that, but I understand how hard that is sometimes for some people in their situation to, to accept that, that there is power in that. Oh, great. I love that so much. It gives me shivers. I'm definitely the woo-woo guy. I'm all about the woo-woo. I wasn't always about the woo-woo. I was mostly about the science. I'm still about the science, but I love the woo-woo because there's mystery. And I think life is, if nothing else, is a mystery to be lived and an adventure to be had and less, um, you know, more that than a problem to be solved, which is what causes so, so much of the misery, you know. Um, and I agree with you. I've had experiences like that myself. I remember once, uh, I was, must have been 12 or 13, I saw a music video and I remember watching the music video and saying, gosh, I just knew right away and felt right away, I'm going to be with that woman one day. You know, I don't know why. I was 12 or 13 and she was a little bit older, quite a bit older. And then a little a few years later, I saw a car in the street and I thought, that's my car. I couldn't tell you why. I just felt, I just felt it like that's, that's mine kind of thing. And it was just such a conviction. And I was not this guy that could do any of this stuff. In fact, I had trouble controlling my mind at all. And then it wasn't, I don't know, but no, six, seven years after that, I remember sitting in that car with that woman and feeling such deep gratitude and my mind being blown, like how could this possibly have, ha possibly have happened that I manifested this experience in such an easy, effortless way? And I didn't really know a whole lot about law of attraction was doing any of that. 
And so Grant, I do agree with you. And there's lots of studies and research to support that actually. You know, so we, we all know about law of attraction and the secret, um, but there's actually lots of science to support precisely what you just spoke to. Um, selective attention, selective perception, confirmation bias. There are all these um, ways in which the human brain works uh, such that when you have an idea in your mind and you especially feel it in your heart, you start to see it show up everywhere. And so the question is, was it there all along or did I draw it in? But you become much more attuned to the opportunities that exist in front of you and you're much more likely to go ahead and do something about them and to act on them. There was even a book I remember reading called The Luck Factor and it was all about that. They ran these studies um, with people. Some people thought they were lucky, some people thought they were unlucky. And they would, you know, as part of the experiment, put $100 bills all throughout the city and all kinds of different objects. And they found that the lucky people actually did turn out to be luckier. The ones that thought they were lucky turned out to be luckier. And the people that were unlucky turned out to be less lucky. And they said, why? It's because the lucky people were looking for opportunities to experience or realize their luckiness, like the luck factor. Mm -hmm. thing. So there's, there are, there's real scientific evidence to support that you get more of what you think about. Um, you and, and you know what, what you think about, you tend to bring about. Mm. Yeah, I, I had a problem when I was a kid of of forcibly trying to ask things for myself. I felt very guilty as well. I, I go when I would sort of say my little prayers at night time, um, and no one really knew that I ever did this. Like it's not something I ever spoke well, about. Well, they do now. They do now. <laughs> what you didn't pray? For me. Well, that's just. I felt guilty. I go. Well, hang on a second. I can't pray for me. I can't pray for something selfish like a great career and a car and a hot chick. You know, I, I should be praying for world <laughs> peace. You know, there's people being bombed in cities. You know, hang on, what kind of what kind of person puts their own hopes and dreams before the world's problems? How old were you? Uh, well, 13, 14, 15, somewhere and in that. you were that, that conflicted. Yeah, and I, I felt really wrong. And I felt like this is selfish. And But then I, I did run into someone later in life and said, they said, no, it's okay to ask for what you need. That's, that's totally okay. Mm. There's plenty of plenty of people in this world and there's other ways to fix world wars and some of those are beyond your abilities anyway just work on you get the best version of you and the world benefits from that best version of you i love that grant i struggle with that myself by the way i used to struggle with that same exact issue for a long time i thought i should be as poor as humanly possible maybe move to a monastery or an ashram because it wasn't right you know to make money and it wasn't right um to focus on myself and i realized um, the error of my ways um, in lots of different, you know, I, haven't, that, I came to that realization for lots of different reasons. But the one thing I discovered to your point is that my wealthiest friends and clients had the ability to help the most number of people. So I was like, mm -hmm. okay, like two beggars can't help each other. They just make each other poor, you know, but somebody who has something, it doesn't have to be money. It might be time. It might be energy. It might be happiness. Like Chesley, your, your happiness is just infectious, it's contagious. And you being happy takes nothing away from the rest of us. In fact, it helps encourage us and it infects us in a way that makes us happier, just being around you, right? And same thing with you, Grant. It's like, if we want to help people with anything in the world, it certainly helps to have it. In order to share it, in order to give it, you have to have it in the first place. And so you're right. I feel similarly, I don't think that, and I don't encourage folks to be poor in any way. If you can help it, you know, I want people to be rich in every way possible, be rich in happiness and peace and love, be rich in time and energy, be rich in money and material possessions. And in your richness, you can share so much more. You can be of so much more benefit to the world. And I think the challenge is when people prioritize, let's say, money or material objects over things that matter more, like health, like peace, like happiness. But there's nothing wrong with being peaceful and happy and loving and having money. I'm telling you, it's easier to meditate in the back of a Bentley, you know, than it is in some crack alley kind of thing, right? So <laughs> I'll encourage you right now. You know, uh, having not come from a whole lot of money. I know that. <laughs> I'm just picturing both of those scenarios thinking. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's very true. We had to work through um, both Grant and I didn't realise, but we had like money guilt or success guilt where we both from, you know, very different backgrounds, um, any money that I ever earned, I gave away. Like I, I would look after everybody else. So everybody was, um, you know, was, was feeling good and I was very generous. Grant, you know, it was the same. So we had to work through that because we started thinking, you know what, if we want to work really, really hard and we want to try and have money because we want to help more and more and more people exactly 
uh, what you were saying there. Yeah, we're and not super got, wealthy, I might add. But, no, but, but we, <laughs> we even with the little the little money that we had, we, we will be. We would go to dinner, for instance. We will be. We will be. We will we're be. manifesting it. <laughs> <laughs> but right we there. would go. Hang on, we have slightly more than that person that we've just asked to dinner, and so we felt an obligation to then offload our money to make the night more comfortable for them. Mm. And then we were doing that in so many scenarios. We realized, hang on, there's we have a pattern of not being comfortable with anything that we've earned and strived for and we were pumping it out to anyone who was in the nearest vicinity to make ourselves feel better to to lessen our own guilt the fact that we were slightly more advantaged um and only i'm, I'm only talking fractions but it was yeah it was a palpable feeling and mm. yeah it was, well we both came from different points sorry different back, from different backgrounds yeah, we, yeah. So Grant had, yeah, you had real, um, it was like a guilt kind of thing, wasn't it? Like you, yeah, it was like a torment because you, you didn't want to live the way that you'd lived when you were younger. And then you felt guilty that you had achieved a lot and, and were, you were earning good money and you didn't want other people then to, you know, to, to miss out. Cause I knew I wasn't special and I knew that the person who had less than me was not, uh, I wasn't better than that person by any stretch. In fact, they were more than likely better than I was. So why did I have the money and they didn't? So it was, a, it became a, yeah, a real issue where I would open the floodgates of my wallet and just let it all disappear. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's interesting. You said I, I, I struggle with the same thing around money also around sex, you know, it was a thing as well. Um, and all that guilt. And it's interesting, you know, and I'm, Look, I am all in support of anything that works for people. So if you've got a religion that works for you, please, I'm all in full support of that. And I think sometimes we can get some very twisted and perverted and unhealthy and unhappy beliefs that we sort of pick up from all kinds of, you know, programs and, um, you know, well-intentioned teachers and ministers and philosophers through the years. And that can stick with us for a long time. And to sort of understand that and to then undo that programming and conditioning can mean a real difference in your life, not just your happiness, but also your success. I mean, I, lo I know lots of folks, and I was certainly one of them, that really always struggle with money because of all these limiting beliefs that I had around money and all the guilt and shame I had around money. So, you know, as soon as you make it, you spend it, and then you believe that there was no pain, no gain, that money didn't grow on trees and all these ideas. And then I had a few experiences, thankfully, that actually came on the heels of me working on my mindset around money that confirmed for me no, Rob, actually, you can make a whole lot more money, a whole lot more easily and enjoyably. And then it was, so, so they all, those limiting beliefs, you know, sort of were destroyed. And um, I quickly discovered that these ideas I had around money were getting in the way of making money, but also getting in the way of being happy. And so mm -hmm. it's important. And I love that you point that out, uh, Grant and Chesky, um, you know, that we all sort of investigate and explore any stressful thoughts or beliefs that we have that are getting in the way of us being rich in any and every way possible mm. i think yeah I what th about I people right. we're little transmitters our little brains are little yeah. transmitters and what we think we put out and what we put out comes back and um, i think we've all got spirit yeah. teams you know we've got spirit teams behind us whether mm. it's you know an almighty creator or whether it's your past relatives whether it's your bloodline you know your ancestors that stand behind you that 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 rally behind you and and want the best for you and i think it's okay it's okay to call on them it's okay to call on them for help you know i'm sure we've all got angels assigned to us as well and just just start asking mm. just start asking mm. i think mm. is it's okay. it's okay i i talk to them all the time but that, i'm also called the crazy lady um, <laughs> As, as my dad said, it's okay to talk to yourself. It's okay to talk to, you know, imaginary people or angels out there. Well, just be careful when you start answering yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, I trouble. do that too. So maybe that's the reason why. I... Um, some people, just before we let you go, some people don't want to be happy though. They like being stuck in this loop of being a victim. Um, do, you, do you find that? Yeah. Um, people tend to... Um, have a preference for familiarity and um, mm -hmm. folks for the most part, and the brain is partly responsible, well, maybe fully responsible for this. We don't really love change. You know, change can be difficult and um, familiarity can be and feel really good. When you don't know true happiness or real happiness, 
it's easy to just accept what you've always accepted and to continue to play the role of victim or believe or genuinely believe that you're a victim because at the very worst, you get sympathy from people and you get people's attention, you get people's affection. Sometimes people develop the same habit around being sick. You know, if you were a child and you didn't get a whole lot of attention or affection from people, your parents or your caregivers, when, but, but you did when you got sick, you can tend to find that in adulthood, you tend to get sick a lot, especially when you're feeling that you want attention or affection. We often don't make the, you know, connect the dots. Uh, but that's precisely what happens. And so you're right about that. Um, I think that when people get a real taste of happiness, a true taste, they don't want to be victims anymore. They just want to be happy. But when you don't have a true taste of happiness, or it's been a long time since you've had that true taste, you can forget how good it is. And you can therefore settle for being a victim because at the very worst, you get these consolation prizes like attention and affection and uh, you know pity and charity. And that can feel a whole lot better than being ignored. Mm, that is wow. so funny you say that. I've had one of the most recent breakthroughs I've had in as I'm constantly trying to sift through my stuff, figure myself out, look for little areas of f- flaws or weaknesses, try and work on, you know, on the on the things that are maybe potentially holding me back. And I went through a period where I was constantly sick or injured. You know, I, I, weird things were happening. I was, I, I, I raced cars. I'd had, I had a really significant car accident. You know, I'd broken my back on another occasion. You know, I'm dislocating shoulders. I'm breaking ribs. I'm constantly ill. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? Why? And our dynamic of our relationship started, we first met when I broke my back. So we, we gone straight into a relationship of carer and patient which was a problematic dy- a dynamic, which was very hard for us to untangle. I um, left work to nurse him. Yeah, a lot of codependence. Wow. Mm. So our relationship was started that way. So then I'm now in this recent period, say the last couple of years, just constantly sick, you know, got ba- really bad heat exhaustion and, you know, and it was nearly very, very severe and nearly died. Uh, he, and, and I was like, what is, what are all these things? If I listed them, I'm, it would be happening, you know, t- 20 times a year in some form or another. He's calling me in to be a nurse. And I realized, yes, I thought, I, I think what's happening here is I'm sabotaging my own health in order to get my emotional needs met. I'm getting attention from my wife. I'm being cared for. I'm being nurtured. I'm being loved. And, and perhaps, you know, I, in my mind, I might have seen her, her being busy and successful and maybe I didn't feel like I was getting enough uh, attention for her. And I've reverted to childhood, Grant, who my mom was always, she was very busy. She had a lot going on, single mom, uh, you know, she would, in the wake of, a, 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 you know, a painful divorce. So getting her attention was quite was quite challenging. She was just trying to make ends meet, you know. She was just trying to get by and survive and, and try and, you know, keep us alive and have food on the table. But I, I what I do remember is my mum was very good when I was ill. When I was ill, bang, I had her attention and she was beautiful and loving and and selfless and I was I felt cared for. And I was realized I'm entering a pattern where I'm repeating my childhood just to get my needs met from my wife. And that was something I only discovered about two weeks ago. And it was like, oh, my God. Grant, mm. first of all, that is the most incredible story. Um, my goodness, that is incredible. It speaks to so much about each of you, um, your strength and your love and your care for each other. It's mind-blowing and really, um, truly inspiring. Gosh, thank you for sharing. And also, you're right, Grant. Um, we all, if we look closely enough into our lives and to our childhood, we'll discover we all have little patterns like this. Some of us have bigger patterns like this, um, like the one you have, but it can be around food. It can be around sick, you know, being sick. Uh, it can be around uh, money. Uh, but yeah, you're, we're wanting to identify uh, those little patterns. And we don't have to do too much digging because we're probably pretty aware of some of it already. Whatever it is, that, that thing that you do or that thing that's happening a lot that feels unhealthy and unhappy. Um, it's getting you some kind of benefit or it has over the years. You know, we only tend to do and continue doing what we're rewarded for. And you just have to find out what the, find out what the payoff is for it, right? So that there's a payoff for being sick and the payoff is getting love and attention and affection. Sometimes the payoff for people eating a whole lot. They protect themselves from, you know, attention from other people or they get attention from other people or they get affection from other people or they just feel comforted when they're eating. And so there's all these subconscious things that go on and they can seem so difficult to sort of tease out. But if you look at your life 
and you notice what unhealthy and unhappy habits you have, you'll pretty easily be able to connect the dots to something that happened in your life. And you don't even have to connect the dots in order to solve for it. But it's good to know um, just that we do what we're rewarded for. And if we can find out what the payoff is, we can you know, quickly begin to solve for it. Yeah, it would. Uh, I must admit that uh, that was that's how where I ended up. But mind you, I went through a lot of pointing. I was pointing at a lot of. I was pointing at her a lot. She was saying I was a shit nurse because I started throwing the food on you, being like, "I've had enough. I'm not just spending my life nursing you. No, this is crap." I thought <laughs> fake illnesses. Get out of bed, you hypochondriac. In my in my wanting to avoid my own uncomfortableness. I was I was blaming her. So I thought maybe because our relationship started in this dynamic of care a patient, she was manifesting the illness to maintain her <laughs> her value. The, I, I'm very I assumed, witchy. I'm very witchy. Yeah. I thought she yeah. was she was receiving value and validation uh, in that carer role where that's where she felt like her calling was or her purpose was or she could help others. So I'm like, she's causing all my illnesses. And I was like, hang on, what happens when you point? When you point, there's three fingers pointing back at you. So I was like, mm. hang on, just stop for a sec. Am, am I offloading my blame to her when really it's me? And it, was, it wasn't until someone pointed that out to me, I was like, shit, it's me. I'm manif- manifesting it. Oh, Grant, so good. Oh, so good. To like, you're right. There's, there's two, <laughs> three expressions that I think of when you said that. And I love the finger pointing, the metaphor of the, uh, the three fingers pointing back. There's one is you spot it, you got it. You spot something, mm-hmm. you have to know. And if it bothers you, you've got to know it's somewhere inside of you. So um, you spot it, you got it. The, you got yeah, it. The, other, the other is what you see or focus on in another, you strengthen in yourself, right? That's also mm-hmm. something to remember. But the point is, which you expressed so beautifully, um, Grant, is that what you said about her, in, in fact, what you thought she was doing to you, you were doing to you. Mm. you are doing to you and it's so easy to you know project and, and place blame there's one more expression that um, we sometimes share in this uh, psychology world which is uh what you can't accept you project you project so <sighs> if you can't fully accept that wow. you're leading or facilitating or causing uh you know yourself to be sick in some way so that you can get to love affection and attention you'll blame the other person for doing it, mm. you can't it. guilty so it's important yeah, me too. I have we to all. also thank uh, Grant for giving me lots of credits uh, for my uh, future medical degree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You got two MDs at this point. <laughs> yeah, I became uh, a pseudo doctor, you know, she halfway did. into our she relationship, really did. and I started questioning myself, thinking maybe I have that. Is it Munchausen's like syndrome or whatever? Yeah. Like maybe I'm trying to. Am I poisoning him? What am I doing here? Yeah. Um, oh, I, yeah. yeah. Which, which is also interesting too, right? Because, and we all experience these codependent relationships because it takes two to tango, right? Yeah. And so yes, there's Grant, you know, having his subconscious stuff kind of come out and maybe pointing fingers at you and blaming you. At the same time, you're having an experience of him that pointing to you and all your stuff, whatever it is you grew up with. And mm. so, yeah, it's interesting how they, you kind of, we all come together in a way that makes, you know, even soul makes we come or twin flames sometimes we come together in a way that helps us to at least see through and work through stuff that maybe began in childhood yeah yeah absolutely oh my god wow well look at that that we, was cool we started out fighting and now we're <laughs> um, really proud and i feel really happy it's yeah, been a wonderful happy. experience <laughs> <laughs> we've really enjoyed this mate um, yeah we really have how can people find you give yourself a massive plug for sure um you can find me at my website at coach rob mac m-a-c-k.com you can find me on most all social media platforms probably most consistently instagram at rob mac m-a-c-k official you can find both uh published books happiness from the inside out and love from the inside out everywhere great books are sold including amazon and barnes and noble thank you both so much you guys um, first of all, you've had everybody on your show ever. I feel so honored and so grateful to be here. You could have, have had anybody on today and you had me. So please know that I feel forever in debt to you both. And I'm such a fan and um, such a, um, you know, so genuinely honored just to be a part of the conversation. Thank ah, you. You're a good man. Thank, Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Thanks for making the time. It was uh, it was wonderful kicking these ideas around and 
And we've learned a lot about ourselves and then hope, hopefully, you know, there's a couple of little nuggets of gold that anyone listening might realize about themselves or the situation they're in, or they can feel more empowered from the information that you've, you've shared with us today, mate. So thank you very much. Yeah. I really appreciate your time and we will see you in Miami because uh, that yes. sounds a whole lot more sunnier than where we live. <laughs> please, please, please come, please. We need your energy here, please. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next week. Uh, manifest it. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. You're listening to, you've been listening to It's All True. And um, yeah, Grant, you have like the biggest smile on your face. Yeah. You're feeling very I, content, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, that was a very special chat. Yeah, yeah. there's some really beautiful stuff in there. I feel, I feel really good. Yeah, I'm going to go outside and spot those birds now, have a look at the shape of the clouds, get myself back in my body, out of my brain. And, and don't injure yourself. Walk on the grass with my bare feet. <laughs> and don't injure myself. And no more crashing cars, no more breaking ribs. I'm a, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. It's all true. The podcast with Grant and Shezzy Denya. Bye-bye.